Hi and welcome to the Mechanics of Heating. This is part 1M and today we're dealing with the immune system. Knowing about the immune system and how it works is very relevant at this time. Please watch these three videos several times if you have to and acquaint yourselves with the body's innate and inherent healing system. Our bodies are healing machines. The immune system, the body cell feeding system, is all about cellular health, that is, keeping the cells in our body healthy. These three contributors to cell deterioration, namely stress, oxidation and inflammation, work together and can cause ill health through cell deterioration and they set up a chain reaction in the body where the one leads to the next and arresting this process is very important to know, know about in order to keep our cells healthy. We will deal with how stress leads to oxidation that leads to inflammation and contributes to an overall uh, immune system in the next lesson or video. This is a crash course in knowing your body, its anatomy and physiology. Enjoy the following video from Crash Course. There are three topics, three videos on this topic. This is the last of the videos on anatomy and physiology and you are encouraged to watch the rest of the videos at the link below. Just Copy and paste the link to your browser. Thank you for watching. Be sure to watch the next part 1M. What's true in World of Warcraft is also true in your immune system. To defeat your enemy, you have to know your enemy. Uncover its weaknesses. Learn how to see it before it sees you. We've already talked about how your innate defense system keeps out or quietly neutralizes pathogens without too much fuss. But sooner or later, a threat's gonna come along that's stronger than what the first responders can handle. That's when it's time for the adaptive or acquired immune system to step in. While your innate system takes its zero tolerance policy very seriously and tries to toast any foreign microbe that it encounters, your adaptive system does things differently. It has to be expressly introduced to a specific pathogen and recognize it as a threat before it will attack. As its name suggests, you're not born with a working adaptive immune system. It's slow to act in part because it takes time for it to shake hands with so many pathogens and get to know them. These introductions may be organic, like touching a dirty faucet in the bathroom or walking into a sneeze. But once it's been introduced to a potential threat, your adaptive defenses never forget it. And this ability to remember specific pathogens is one of the key differences between the adaptive and innate defenses. Another main difference is that adaptive immunity is systemic. Rather than being restricted to a particular infection in, say, a sinus or a sliced finger, your adaptive system can fight throughout your whole body at once. And it does this by deploying one or both of its separate but cooperating defenses, your humoral immunity and your cellular defenses. Your humoral immunity, which you might not have heard of before, works by dispatching important proteins that I'm sure you have heard of, antibodies. They're made by special white blood cells and they patrol the body's humor or fluids like blood and lymph, where they combat viruses and bacteria moving around the interstitial space between your cells. Much of what you know or have heard about or think of when your immune system is humoral immunity. It's why if you had mumps as a kid, you probably don't have to worry about getting it again for the rest of your life. It's also why doctors and nurses and patients who have been infected with the Ebola virus, a disease curable, have lived to tell about it. And it's why... Whether you're protecting yourself from infections or playing an MMO, one of the first steps in any good defensive strategy is to be able to tell your friend from your foe. And in the case of your immune system, that means being able to identify antigens. An antigen could be an invader from the outside world, like a bacterium, virus, or fungus, or it could be a toxin or a diseased cell within your own body. But in any case, antigens are large signaling molecules not normally found in the body, and they act as flags that get the adaptive immune system riled up. So let's say a flu virus gets inside of you, and it's floating around trying to find a good 
good host cell to start multiplying inside of. Before it finds that cell, hopefully it will be paid a visit by one of the stars of your humoral response, a B lymphocyte. Like all blood cells, these guys originate in your bone marrow, but unlike other white blood cells, they also mature in the bone marrow too. And as a B cell matures, it develops the ability to determine friend from foe, developing both immunocompetence, or how to recognize and bind to a particular antigen, as well as self-tolerance, or knowing how to not attack your body's own cells. Once it's fully mature, a B lymphocyte displays at least 10,000 special protein receptors on its surface. These are its membrane-bound antibodies. All B lymphocytes have them, but the cool thing is every individual lymphocyte has its own unique antibodies, each of which is ready to identify and bind to a particular kind of antigen. That means that with all of your B lymphocytes together, it's like having two billion keys on your immune system's keychain, each of which can only open one door. So part of your immune system's strategy is just to win with overwhelming odds. The more unique antibodies your lymphocytes have, the more likely it is that one will eventually find, bind to, and mark a particular antigen. Once they've matured, B cells colonize or seed your secondary lymphoid organs like your lymph nodes and start roaming around in your blood and lymph. At this point, they're still naive and untested, and they won't be truly activated until they meet their perfect enemy match. Which brings us back to the flu virus. When the right B cell finally bumps into an antigen it has antibodies for, usually in a lymph node or in the spleen, and recognizes it, it binds to it. This summons the full power of the humoral immune response, and the cell basically goes into berserker mode. Once activated, the B cell starts cloning itself like crazy, quickly producing an army of similar cells, all with the instructions for the exact same antibodies that are designed to fight that one particular antigen. Most of these clones become active fighters, or effector cells, but a few become long-lived memory cells that preserve the genetic code for that specific successful antibody. This ensures that if and when the antigen returns, there will be a prepared secondary immune response that's both stronger and faster than the first. This is key to why vaccinations are so brilliant and important, which I'll come back to in a minute. But while the memory cells are just there to hang back and record things, the effector, or plasma cells, are packed with extra amounts of rough endoplasmic reticulum, which acts as an antibody factory. These cells can mass-produce the same antibodies over and over for that particular invader, spitting them out into the humor at a rate of around 2,000 antibodies per second for four or five days until they die. And the antibodies they make work the same way that the membrane-bound ones do. They're just free-floating. So they ride the tides of blood and lymph binding to all the antigens they can find and marking them for death. Now antibodies can't really do the killing themselves, but they do have a few moves that could make it hard for intruders to take hold. One of their most effective and common strategies is neutralization, where antibodies physically block the binding sites on viruses or bacterial toxins so they can't hook up to your tissues. And because antibodies have more than one binding site, they can bind to multiple antigens at the same time in a process called agglutination. The resulting clumps can't get around easily, which makes it easier for macrophages to come and gobble them up. And not only that, but while all this is going on, antibodies are also ringing a chemical dinner bell, calling in phagocytes from the innate immune system and special lymphocytes from the adaptive system to destroy these messy little antigen antibody clumps. So the point of all of this in the short term is to keep you healthy, but in the long term, this process also adds to your overall immunity. The humoral response allows your body to achieve immunity by encountering pathogens either randomly or on purpose. Active humoral immunity is what we were just talking about. It's when B cells bump into antigens and start cranking out antibodies. This can occur naturally, like when you catch the flu or get chicken pox or pick up some nasty bacterial infection, or it can happen artificially, particularly through vaccination. Most vaccines are made of a dead or extremely weakened pathogen, and they work on the premise that because a secondary immune response is more intense than a primary response, by introducing a pathogen into your body, you're priming it to fight hard and fast should that antigen show up again. In the case of typically non-fatal infections like the common flu, this immunity should at least spare you from some of the most severe symptoms. But in the case of more serious diseases like polio, smallpox, measles, and whooping cough, vaccinations can be truly life-saving. Now some antigens, like those from mumps or measles, don't really change much over time, so a few immunizations will leave you set for life. But others, like influenza, are constantly evolving and changing their surface antigens, so immunity to last year's flu probably doesn't work against this year's flu. Still, acquired immunity doesn't have to be active. Babies, for example, naturally obtain passive humoral immunity while still in the womb. They receive ready-made antibodies from their mothers through the placenta and later on through breast milk. And that works pretty well for a few months, but the protection is temporary because passively obtained antibodies don't live long in their new body, and they can't produce effector cells or memory cells, so a baby's own system won't remember an antigen if it gets infected again. You can also acquire this kind of temporary passive immunity artificially by receiving exogenous antibodies from the plasma of an immune donor. This is what recently saved some doctors and nurses who had contracted the Ebola 
the virus from infected patients. A serum was made from the blood plasma of other medical workers who had been infected and survived. The antibodies helped defend the patients from the virus before their own active immunity could identify that particular antigen and start creating their own antibodies. It's not the same as a vaccine, which immediately engages your B cells, but it can buy a patient some crucial, life-saving time against an infection that would otherwise quickly kill. But B cells and antibodies are only part of the immunity equation. There are plenty of pathogens that quickly worm their way right inside your cells, where they're safer from the humoral response and free to multiply as much as they'd like. Luckily, your immune system has yet another game plan and a new set of players ready to fight that final battle with cell-to-cell -cell combat. Make sure you catch our final episode next week and learn all about this epic battle royale. But as for today, in our second to last episode, you learned how the adaptive immune system's humoral response guards your extracellular terrain against pathogens. We looked at how B cells mature, identify antigens, and make antibodies, and how antibodies swarm pathogens and mark them for death. We also talked about active and passive humoral immunity and how vaccines work. Thank you to our headmaster of learning, Linnea Boyev, and thank you to all of our Patreon patrons. If you are one of those people I just thanked, you make Crash Course possible for the whole world and also for yourself. If you like Crash Course and you want to help us make videos like this one, you can go to patreon.com slash Crash Course. This episode was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake DiPastino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed by Nicholas Jenkins, edited by Nicole Sweeney. Our sound designer is Michael Aranda, and the graphics. It is time! We have arrived at the final conflict. The Battle Royale. A fight to the... Well, hopefully not death, but a big fight anyway. It only seems fitting that we spend this, our last episode of Anatomy and Physiology, talking about one of your body's last ditch efforts to defend itself at all costs. This is what happens when all the other fail-safes have failed. Your skin and mucous membranes did what they could as physical barriers against infection, and your humoral immune response cranked out antibodies in an effort to keep your interstitial spaces healthy. But when those systems weren't enough, your cells themselves were breached, and pathogens and abnormalities began to run amok where antibodies could not get to them. Now it becomes the business of your cell-mediated or cellular immune response. And that's where stuff gets real, where cell fights cell. And where heroes look like T lymphocytes. These lymphocytes, known on the streets as T cells, go after body cells that have been hijacked by things like viruses or bacteria or become cancerous. T cells cause inflammation, activate macrophages, get other T cells fired up, and generally regulate much of the immune response. Which is important because of all the ways in this course that we have described how you could die, two that we have neglected to mention are what happens if your body completely fails to protect itself, and what happens if your immune system goes rogue and attacks your own healthy cells. But even when they're functioning well, some of of your immune cells are careening around your body like miniature biological versions of Mad Max War Boys. Amped up on signaling chemicals, scouring the terrain for hostiles, and covered from top to bottom in the dismembered parts of the enemies that they have vanquished. They're out to protect all of the tissues and organ systems that we've been talking about for the past 46 weeks, and these guys play for keeps. If there are cells in your body that look and act like they're from some post-apocalyptic hellscape, it's gotta be the cells in your immune system. Aside from the fact that they go around literally eating their enemies and have names like natural killers, some of these cells are dressed for the part too. Specifically, they go around wearing parts of the organisms they've killed so others can see them. Sounds a little bit messed up, but we're talking life and death here. The stakes are high. And this kind of behavior occurs both in your innate immune response and your acquired response. We've already talked about how in the innate response, when a phagocyte sees a suspicious character, it engulfs it and kills it, right? But what we didn't get into before is that during its attack, the phagocyte actually breaks the pathogen into tons of tiny molecules and then proudly displays those broken bits in grooved proteins on its outer membrane. These proteins are called major histocompatibility complexes, or MHCs, and they're a lot like how Vlad the Impaler decorated his front yard with the bodies of his skewered enemies. Or how a battle-crazed warrior might show off a necklace made of knuckle bones. Because cells from both your innate and adaptive branches do this grisly accessorizing like it's their job, they are referred to as professional antigen-presenting cells. Which might make you think, is there an amateur version of an antigen-presenting cell? And yeah, there kinda is. Every nucleated cell in your body, which means all of your cells except for red blood cells, have one kind of MHC protein on their surface called class 1 MHC. MHC1 proteins present short chains of amino acids that are based on endogenous proteins, that is, proteins synthesized inside that cell. So if a particular cell is healthy, the antigens on its MHC1 tell roving 
immune cells that everything is okay inside, nothing to see here. But if the cell is, say, cancerous and it's making abnormal proteins, then it'll fix bits of those proteins to its MHC, which alerts immune cells that there's a problem inside and basically asks to be killed. Now, your immune-related cells, like macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells, wear class 2 MHC proteins on their outsides. These are the professionals. Class 2 MHC proteins bind to fragments of exogenous antigens, like a virus that's been engulfed, broken up, and displayed to get the attention of other cells. And this is how MHCs are totally essential to the cellular immune response. Because the heroes of your cellular defenses, the T cells, can't actually detect whole antigens. They can only recognize them when they're all diced up and decorating an antigen-presenting cell. T cells are made in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus, the lymphoid gland that sits on top of your heart, and which is actually what the T in T cell stands for. And you have several different kinds of T cells, but the two you really have to know about are helper Ts and cytotoxic cells. Helper Ts themselves can't kill, but they can activate cells that do, and they help call the shots for the whole adaptive immune response. Meanwhile, cytotoxic cells are the ones that actually do the killing of the cells gone bad. Now, much like how a naive B cell carries antibodies for one specific antigen, a naive helper T cell has receptors that will only bind to one specific combination of a class 2 MHC and a particular antigen. If that matches right, the helper T bonds to the MHC antigen bit and it gets activated. Then, just like with the B cells we talked about last time, the helper T starts copying itself like crazy, making a few memory T cells as well, which remember that particular antigen should it meet one again in the future. And it also produces a whole mess of effector T cells, mostly more helper Ts, but also some regulatory T cells that I will get to in a minute. But the main thing the helper T cells do is raise the alarm that tells other immune cells that there is a problem. And they do this by releasing a cocktail of chemical messengers called cytokines. When a cytokine enters another helper T, that cell usually starts dividing, making more memory T cells and more helper Ts, which release more cytokines that keep boosting the signal. And some of those cytokines also go on to help activate the cytotoxic T cells. You know that macrophages from the innate system just sort of roll up and swallow pathogens whole, but cytotoxic T cells do their killing a little differently. They roam the blood and lymph looking for hijacked amateur body cells that are asking to be killed. Basically, these infected cells are already dying, so they've digested some of their invaders' proteins and stuck them on some of their class 1 MHCs, effectively waving a surrender flag made of fragments of the very virus or cancer that is destroying them. If a cytotoxic T cell with the right receptor floats by, it binds to the antigen MHC combination and moves in for a mercy killing. It does this by releasing special enzymes that punch holes in the cell's membrane or otherwise trigger apoptosis, killing both the cell and whatever is inside of it. Then the cytotoxic cell just detaches and continues to run down other prey. So by now it should be pretty obvious that without T cells there basically is no adaptive immune response, and it really all comes back to the helper Ts. Which is why immunodeficiencies can be so deadly. AIDS, for example, is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus that specifically attacks helper T cells, and without the helper Ts there wouldn't be much of a humoral response either. Because the cytokines that come screaming out of the helpers not only activate other T cells, but they also finish the training of the B cells. The fact is, most of your so-called naive B cells don't get fully activated and become memory or effector cells when they first bind to an antigen. And there's a good reason for that. Since antibody receptors are generated randomly, you might wind up with B cells that could bind to your own healthy proteins, like, say, your growth hormone. So once a B cell interacts with a substance, whether it's growth hormone or some dangerous bacterium, it still needs to bind to it, engulf it, and present some fragments of it on its surface. But then it'll stop to await inspection. It pauses until the right helper T cell comes by to check out its presentation. If the T cell binds to the presented fragment, then it releases cytokines which fully activate the B cell, and suddenly you got antibodies going everywhere. But if it doesn't, then the B cell just goes about its business and doesn't trigger an immune response. This check and balance between Bs and Ts is an important safeguard against your immune system becoming too good at its job. Which is a very real risk. A hyperactive immune system can cause mayhem by losing its ability to distinguish enemy from self as it turns on your own body. Your regulatory T cells, another type of effector, help prevent this by releasing inhibiting cytokines that tell other immune cells to stand down once the initial threat has been handled. Without that regulation, the body might start cranking out too many antibodies and cytotoxic cells that could damage or destroy its own tissues. This dangerous confusion is what causes many autoimmune diseases, like multiple sclerosis, which eats away at the myelin sheaths around neurons, or type 1 diabetes, which tears up the pancreatic cells that make insulin. So the takeaway here is that your immune system is usually really good at its job, which is to kill stuff in the name of keeping you alive. And you really don't want it to go rogue on you, because if there's one thing you should have learned in the past year with us, it's that your body is both resilient 
resilient and fragile, and it survives only when the sum of its many complicated parts stays balanced and works together. And that is the glorious wonder of you. As we wrapped up our tour of the immune system today, you learned how the cellular immune response uses helper, cytotoxic, and regulatory T cells to attack body cells compromised by pathogens. We looked at how cytokines activate B and T cells, and what happens if your immune system goes rogue and starts causing autoimmune trouble. Thank you to our headmaster of learning, Linnea Boyev, and thank you to all of our Patreon patrons whose monthly contributions help make Crash Course possible, not only for themselves, but for everybody everywhere. If you like Crash Course, and want to help us keep making videos like this one and teaching courses like anatomy and physiology, visit patreon.com slash crash course. This episode was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake DiPastino and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed by Nicholas Jenkins, edited... It is time! We have arrived at the final conflict. The Battle Royale. A fight to the... Well, hopefully not death, but a big fight anyway. It only seems fitting that we spend this, our last episode of Anatomy and Physiology, talking about one of your body's last ditch efforts to defend itself at all costs. This is what happens when all the other fail-safes have failed. Your skin and mucous membranes did what they could as physical barriers against infection, and your humoral immune response cranked out antibodies in an effort to keep your interstitial spaces healthy. But when those systems weren't enough, your cells themselves were breached, and pathogens and abnormalities began to run amok where antibodies could not get to them. Now it becomes the business of your cell-mediated or cellular immune response. And that's where stuff gets real, where cell fights cell. And where heroes look like T lymphocytes. These lymphocytes, known on the streets as T cells, go after body cells that have been hijacked by things like viruses or bacteria or become cancerous. T cells cause inflammation, activate macrophages, get other T cells fired up, and generally regulate much of the immune response. Which is important because of all the ways in this course that we have described how you could die, two that we have neglected to mention are what happens if your body completely fails to protect itself, and what happens if your immune system goes rogue and attacks your own healthy cells. But even when they're functioning well, some of your immune cells are careening around your body like miniature biological versions of Mad Max War Boys. Amped up on signaling chemicals, scouring the terrain for hostiles, and covered from top to bottom in the dismembered parts of the enemies that they have vanquished. They're out to protect all of the tissues and organ systems that we've been talking about for the past 46 weeks, and these guys play for keeps. If there are cells in your body that look and act like they're from some post-apocalyptic hellscape, it's gotta be the cells in your immune system. Aside from the fact that they go around literally eating their enemies and have names like natural killers, some of these cells are dressed for the part too. Specifically, they go around wearing parts of the organisms they've killed so others can see them. Sounds a little bit messed up, but we're talking life and death here. The stakes are high. And this kind of behavior occurs both in your innate immune response and your acquired response. We've already talked about how in the innate response, when a phagocyte sees a suspicious character, it engulfs it and kills it, right? But what we didn't get into before is that during its attack, the phagocyte actually breaks the pathogen into tons of tiny molecules and then proudly displays those broken bits in grooved proteins on its outer membrane. These proteins are called major histocompatibility complexes, or MHCs, and they're a lot like how Vlad the Impaler decorated his front yard with the bodies of his skewered enemies. Or how a battle-crazed warrior might show off a necklace made of knuckle bones. Because cells from both your innate and adaptive branches do this grisly accessorizing like it's their job, they are referred to as professional antigen-presenting cells. Which might make you think, is there an amateur version of an antigen-presenting cell? And yeah, there kinda is. Every nucleated cell in your body, which means all of your cells except for red blood cells, have one kind of MHC protein on their surface called class 1 MHC. MHC1 proteins present short chains of amino acids that are based on endogenous proteins, that is, proteins synthesized inside that cell. So if a particular cell is healthy, the antigens on its MHC1 tell roving immune cells that everything is okay inside, nothing to see here. But if the cell is, say, cancerous and it's making abnormal proteins, then it'll fix bits of those proteins to its MHC, which alerts immune cells that there's a problem inside and basically asks to be killed. Now, your immune-related cells, like macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells, wear class 2 MHC proteins on their outsides. These are the professionals. Class 2 MHC proteins bind to fragments of exogenous antigens, like a virus that's been engulfed, broken up, and displayed to get the attention of other 
our cells. And this is how MHCs are totally essential to the cellular immune response. Because the heroes of your cellular defenses, the T cells, can't actually detect whole antigens. They can only recognize them when they're all diced up and decorating an antigen-presenting cell. T cells are made in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus, the lymphoid gland that sits on top of your heart, and which is actually what the T in T cell stands for. And you have several different kinds of T cells, but the two you really have to know about are helper Ts and cytotoxic cells. Helper Ts themselves can't kill, but they can activate cells that do, and they help call the shots for the whole adaptive immune response. Meanwhile, cytotoxic cells are the ones that actually do the killing of the cells gone bad. Now, much like how a naive B cell carries antibodies for one specific antigen, a naive helper T cell has receptors that will only bind to one specific combination of a class 2 MHC and a particular antigen. If that matches right, the helper T bonds to the MHC antigen bit and it gets activated. Then, just like with the B cells we talked about last time, the helper T starts copying itself like crazy, making a few memory T cells as well, which remember that particular antigen should it meet one again in the future. And it also produces a whole mess of effector T cells, mostly more helper Ts, but also some regulatory T cells that I will get to in a minute. But the main thing the helper T cells do is raise the alarm that tells other immune cells that there is a problem. And they do this by releasing a cocktail of chemical messengers called cytokines. When a cytokine enters another helper T, that cell usually starts dividing, making more memory T cells and more helper Ts, which release more cytokines that keep boosting the signal. And some of those cytokines also go on to help activate the cytotoxic T cells. You know that macrophages from the innate system just sort of roll up and swallow pathogens whole, but cytotoxic T cells do their killing a little differently. They roam the blood and lymph looking for hijacked amateur body cells that are asking to be killed. Basically, these infected cells are already dying, so they've digested some of their invaders' proteins and stuck them on some of their class 1 MHCs, effectively waving a surrender flag made of fragments of the very virus or cancer that is destroying them. If a cytotoxic T cell with the right receptor floats by, it binds to the antigen MHC combination and moves in for a mercy killing. It does this by releasing special enzymes that punch holes in the cell's membrane or otherwise trigger apoptosis, killing both the cell and whatever is inside of it. Then the cytotoxic cell just detaches and continues to run down other prey. So by now it should be pretty obvious that without T cells there basically is no adaptive immune response, and it really all comes back to the helper Ts, which is why immunodeficiencies can be so deadly. AIDS, for example, is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus that specifically attacks helper T cells, and without the helper Ts, there wouldn't be much of a humoral response either. Because the cytokines that come screaming out of the helpers not only activate other T cells, but they also finish the training of the B cells. The fact is, most of your so-called naive B cells don't get fully activated and become memory or effector cells when they first bind to an antigen. And there's a good reason for that. Since antibody receptors are generated randomly, you might wind up with B cells that could bind to your own healthy proteins, like, say, your growth hormone. So once a B cell interacts with a substance, whether it's growth hormone or some dangerous bacterium, it still needs to bind to it, engulf it, and present some fragments of it on its surface. But then it'll stop to await inspection. It pauses until the right helper T cell comes by to check out its presentation. If the T cell binds to the presented fragment, then it releases cytokines which fully activate activate the B cell, and suddenly you got antibodies going everywhere. But if it doesn't, then the B cell just goes about its business and doesn't trigger an immune response. This check and balance between Bs and Ts is an important safeguard against your immune system becoming too good at its job, which is a very real risk. A hyperactive immune system can cause mayhem by losing its ability to distinguish enemy from self as it turns on your own body. Your regulatory T cells, another type of effector, help prevent this by releasing inhibiting cytokines that tell other immune cells to stand down once the initial threat has been handled. Without that regulation, the body might start cranking out too many antibodies and cytotoxic cells that could damage or destroy its own tissues. This dangerous confusion is what causes many autoimmune diseases, like multiple sclerosis, which eats away at the myelin sheaths around neurons, or type 1 diabetes, which tears up the pancreatic cells that make insulin. So the takeaway here is that your immune system is usually really good at its job, which is to kill stuff in the name of keeping you alive. And you really don't want it to go rogue on you, because if there's one thing you should have learned in the past year with us, it's that your body is both resilient and fragile, and it survives only when the sum of its many complicated parts stays balanced and works together. And that 
is the glorious wonder of you. As we wrapped up our tour of the immune system today, you learned how the cellular immune response uses helper, cytotoxic, and regulatory T cells to attack body cells compromised by pathogens. We looked at how cytokines activate B and T cells, and what happens if your immune system goes rogue and starts causing autoimmune trouble. Thank you to our headmaster of learning, Linnea Boyev, and thank you to all of our Patreon patrons whose monthly contributions help make Crash Course possible, not only for themselves, but for everybody everywhere. If you like Crash Course and want to help us keep making videos like this one and teaching courses like anatomy and physiology, visit patreon.com slash crash course. This episode was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake DiPastino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed by Nicholas Jenkins, edited by Nicole Sweeney. Our sound designer is Michael Aranda, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe. Thank you.